Okay, so let's uh, do a quick recap. Um, so this is part two of, of a two-section class. The first one was on Monday. And uh, what we're trying to do now is to go back a bit to the statistical learning theory setting, asking questions such as, in which sense a good algorithm is good? How do we quantify that? And more generally, what are the expectations we can have about any learning algorithm, about how good or bad they can be? Okay, so we went back to the original formulation of the problem, which is the one that basically says, given um, a loss function and a distribution, you want to solve the minimization of the expected risk over a class, which is all the possible function where the expected risk is defined. Nothing practical, but somewhat shooting for the best. All you're given is a training set, which is sample IID. This is the super shorthand notation. Are the symbols clear? Because I introduced them a long time, but uh, just to be sure that you all remember what they are, otherwise I'm going to write them down. This is when you have to speak, because if you don't know what they are, I'm going to use them 15 times right now. Is that good? So this is the expected risk. It's the expected loss function over uh, all possible training set points. All right, oh, sorry, all possible uh, data uh, from the distribution. So it's the expectation over the whole distribution. And this is just a sample, which is n pairs sample IID. Okay? I use this shorthand notation. So a statistical learning algorithm is a statistical procedure that sends, a, sorry, the training set into a function. And I typically, I'm going to use, uh, say, this shorthand notation or when you get annoyed by it, I'm going to write exactly. So this hat stands for a quantity that depends on the data. And sometimes when you, know, when you get annoyed by this uh, lack of uh, details, I might add the whole thing, which is the sample with its size. Okay. And the question is, okay, given this problem and given the you know, uh, potential solution of the problem, how do we quantify the quality of this solution? Well, we're trying to solve this problem. So uh, we can just look at something like this the uh, so-called excess risk. This is the one natural quantity, OK? Because it says, how far is my potential solution to the true solution? Nothing here can be computed in practice aside from the solution that I found. Everything is purely theoretical, but that's kind of what you want to do. In a lot of situations, you assume that you have an ideal problem you like to solve. In practice, you have something that is perturbed with noise, sampling, and so on. And yet, once you want to try to study the quality of this, you would like to know how well you solved the original problem, not the noisy problem. Okay? This is the same story. If you're familiar, you know, any kind of statistical problem is like this, any kind of problem where you have to talk about some kind of robustness or stability with respect to noise is going to have this similar flavor. So nothing different with respect to that. One comment that we made is sometimes we might be at least able analytically to derive what is the form of the function that minimizes this. But at least for this discussion, we don't care that much because we don't want functions to be close at every point. We just want to produce the same error. Okay? If they do produce the same error, we're happy. So this is interp the exact interpretation of this. this. is the best possible error, and this is the error of uh, my potential solution. Which error? Not the one on the training, but the one on future data. First so good? A key point of this is that this whole quantity is a random quantity, because it, this hefet is actually depending through all the data set, which is assumed to be random. So typically, unless you make some strong assumption, you will need to uh, deploy some probabilistic tool to make sense of what does it mean for that quantity to be 0 or to go to 0. Okay. <clears throat> and last time we discussed that, you, for example, you can work in expectation or in probability. So typically, we want to make statements about what happens to this quantity when the number of points goes to infinity. And again, you can do it by essentially either putting here an expectation, OK? Or, oh, let me do it like this, which is slightly better. So let me give a name to this quantity. Let me call it delta n rho f. 
is the deviation of the, the, the one I have to the true one. It depends on the number of points. It depends on the distribution that generates the data. And it depends on which class I put here, in which case is everything. Okay. So now I can use a shorthand, which is basically saying, okay, I want to make sense of the fact that delta n has to go to 0 when the, in the limit of the number of points going to infinity. OK? Does that make sense? And I can say this by basically either putting here an expectation or considering instead the probability of this delta n rho f bigger, bigger than epsilon being equal to 0. OK? This is a stronger requirement than this. This is what it's called. It's the, it's the equivalent to L2 convergence or convergence expectation. This is weak convergence or convergence in probability. Okay. Typically, under the assumption that we made, oftentimes you can get either one. I'm going to be uh, sometimes switching between one or the other, depending on where the specific point to something might be easier to prove. Okay. I start from this primarily because this is historically the one which is used the most. is a, is a weaker requirement. But if you look in a lot of learning theory, these are the one they use. For a lot of the reasoning we make, this is fine enough, OK? Because we're going to be able to get there. OK, so the first kind of results we discussed is where something like this has to happen for all distribution. If you want, it's a pointwise requirement. And this is what is called, this requirement is called consistency. And if it holds for, uh, not for a fixed distribution, but for all possible distribution, this is called uh, universal consistency. We saw last time that just by writing uh, the definition of the limit, this says also that we can actually say something about how many points we need to achieve a certain precision in our estimate. But typically, this quantity will depend on rho. So the next step we asked is to basically try to go a bit in the direction of non-asymptotic results, or it, which exactly what it means is that I want to be able to make statements that are independent to rho. I would like to be able to say how many points I need for any problem to achieve a certain accuracy. And so the idea would be to essentially move from this kind of requirement to something that looks more like this. I want to study, for example, an expectation the behavior of this quantity. It's still a random variable. But in some sense, I want now this statement to be true for all possible distributions. Okay? So I put the supremum over all possible distributions. Okay? Unfortunately, at this point, the story takes a slight turn. At this point, I'm just introducing measure of uh, quality. Then we take a parenthesis to just really discover that this would be, this is impossible. The foundational results, which is an impossibility result, it says there exists no algorithm that can do this. Whenever you fix an algorithm, I can show you that there is at least one distribution where this quantity is bigger than a sequence that does not converge to zero. OK? Again, this is a, while here we're just asking the question, OK, how do I measure the quality of a solution? Here we switch gears and we say, by the way, don't ask this question because it doesn't exist any algorithm with that property. So now we have to shift gear a bit. Because remember, we were led to ask this question not just by curiosity, but about the desire to be able to make finite sample statements, to say for any distribution, what is the precision we can hope for given n points or the other way around, how many points we need to achieve a certain accuracy. So we're left a bit with the curiosity of saying, OK, so uh, first of all, can I do something like universal consistent algorithm? Can I find something that converges for any distribution? I might not know what is the number of points I need to get a precision, but I know that there exists something. I don't be able to compute it because it depends on the distribution. But it, you know, I know it goes to the right place. And question two, can we ever made Finite sample statement that holds for all distributions. That make sense? And what we did then is basically saying, OK, we, we can, you, once you have to make this weaker, again, you can keep this question, the universal consistency, in which case, rather than a soup over a possible distribution, you just pick, uh, you just consider this pointwise limit for any row. Or you can consider a different question, which is the one where you want, you're, you're, 
stubborn about that soup, but you're willing to give up the true function space. So you consider here a class, which is strictly containing f. It's not as big as f, OK? It's strictly small. At this point, nothing, you know, the, the, the impossibility result is now gone, OK? So nothing says that there is no algorithm that can achieve that. And now we're curious if there is at least one algorithm for which I can achieve this uniform bound, OK? Does it exist an algorithm for which I can prove that this limit goes to 0? Because if it does, I can at least get a feeling of what's going on. The literature here concentrated a lot on the idea of how to come up with algorithm that can do this, and also what is the interplay with the algorithm I can use in this C. Because again, you can imagine that while that question is hard, exactly because f can be anything, this question, what we commented on, is that it can be arbitrarily simple the moment I choose a, a function class which is particularly small. So I expect, in some extent, the size of this class to matter in this story. Okay. And so the majority of the results try to basically characterize the, how big can be a class or how, what is the biggest kind of class that we can use and still be sure that this holds true. We already know that f is too big, so we try to see how big can it be before we cannot do it anymore. Okay? Because also at this point, as I told you, we are so much curious about the existence of an algorithm that can do it. The, 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 the side of the theory here concentrate on ERM, okay? Empiric risk minimization. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to consider just one specific algorithm and give you a feeling of how I can indeed achieve this. And this will depend on how big is the class C. So empirical risk minimization is just one specific way of defining this guy. And is the one where I just replace the true risk with the empirical one. OK? Rather than looking at that problem, I look at, at the problem defined by the data. Is this notation clear? It's just empirical risk, OK? And as above, I just uh, omit the argument. So now our goal is given and given, um, given a class and given empirical data, form this estimator and get a feeling of if you, under which condition you might be able to achieve something like this, OK? So we want to now study exactly this quantity, which is defined over there. E of f hat s n minus minimum of E over what? That's correct. C. OK? Because we now we are playing this game of restricting things. OK? And what we did last time, and that's one of the main reasons to use ERM here, is that we said, OK, we're going to do this and decompose this. <coughs> OK, let me, let me drop the SN now because it's annoying. It's SN. It's just a defect. I used to use that short notation. I add then subtract the empirical risk. So I add and subtract to something. So I would like I, this, this kind of way of doing things to prove things in learning theory it happens all the time. You want to try not relate quantity. And the way you do it is by adding and subtracting something, which is somewhat relating them in some interesting way. OK? So the point here is that this guy minimized the empirical risk, but I want to put it in contact with the minimized of the expected risk. So what I do is that I add and subtract the empirical risk at its minimizer. OK? You always do. Please add and subtract something, typically. Uh, buh, buh, buh. Is that correct? I think so. So at that, what we did the last time is just, again, we are in the, again, what we're trying to achieve is to get a feeling of what are the, how the size of the C enters the game. And what we did last time is uh, uh, commenting briefly how this quantity is going to become the main object of interest. And this is because if you consider the expectation and recalling the fact that let me rewrite
write this this way. So the minimum is equal to e hat f hat. So what we did last time is basically showing that this term is always smaller or equal than 0. Do you remember how we did it? Well, essentially, again, this is not the, this was not the main part of this. The main part of the story is discussing here, but it was just showing that you can kill this. Yes? Like, you're right, that epsilon hat of f hat has been over C. So I use exactly this. And then the idea is that because you can somewhat swap order of uh, the minimum and the expectation, then you can basically show that you get exactly a quantity is more or equal than zero. Okay, so you have, can do this magic thing. Um, this trick doesn't work in this case because uh, it hinges, the trick I showed you last time hinges on this fact that you can replay, you can swap the order of the expectation and the mean. It only gives you an upper bound, and to actually use it here, you would need a lower bound. So you're left thinking how you can use this. You, how can you can treat this quantity? There is no obvious way to show something about this. A first, uh, a first uh, uh, point is to say, okay, but this e hat is defined like this. And this is defined like this. So this is just expectation. Okay? So I want to put them close. And this quantity smells a bit like the usual quantity that you have to control when you do the law of large number. Okay? Again, call this. Zi, then this would be essentially e z, okay? This whole thing becomes e of z, because all the variables, remember, they're independently distributed. And this quantity here becomes 1 over n, sum i from 1 to n zi, right? And again, if you didn't lie and you actually took a machine learning course, I bet somebody must have told you that the law of large number is kind of interesting and uh, we have a bunch of different results. And not only say that the limit goes to zero, but you can also quantify how quick, Markov inequality, Chernov inequality, and so on and so forth. So one could say, okay, you know, I know that, I also know that when I do uh, an expectation of the positive variable, I can also compute The gradient like this, so you know, if whether I want to do things in probability or with the expectation, if I can control the probability of this being bigger than, uh, let me call it epsilon, then I'm good to go. And the law of large number basically says exactly that if you, sorry, for any for any variable v. So the law of large number says, okay, consider this random variable. Okay, if zi is a sequence of iid random variable, then under a variety of assumptions on them, I can pr control this quantity okay? in such a way that uh, I show that the probability of this deviation happening goes to zero with the number of points. And the typical results we're interested about are fairly strong, are exponential bounds that typically have this form. These results hold, for example, if zi are iid, and I assume more than one, okay? And E Z is the the is the expectation of any of them. Okay. So again, once you have this, you could get the results in expectation just by integrating this quantity. We're not going to do it. It's clear that you can do it in exponential, right? So you can do this in the integration of the tail of this distribution. So we don't. Again, this this is like teeny tiny background. Okay, this is some of the stuff we covered in the math camp at the beginning. This is when it becomes a bit more useful. But the question is, is what is written on the border enough to achieve what we want, which is controlling the deviation of the expected to the empirical risk of the estimator? And this, as I, as I try to underline, it's kind of the important point of, uh, of uh, this whole story. This whole thing is not enough. Why? No. 
What? Anybody? Because of course, you know, this is a mathematical fact. This is a mathematical fact. It's a perfectly fine identification. And then I could, if all I care about is this, would be OK. But here, you see, these zi are all independent. If I consider an f that doesn't depend on anything, all right? or at most depends on exactly on this guy. But when you see our symbol f hat, an f hat that depends on the it means that it depends on the training set. So actually, it depends simultaneously of everybody else. So it's not true that this quantity is an ID sequence, and it's not in an ID sequence is a way that you can control somehow. It's really you know non IID in a bad way. It controls. It depends in a complicated way by all elements of the sequence. Notice that this happened also here. But as, as we noticed last time, just because we just need an upper bound and we can swap minimum and expectation, we get rid of it. If you want to go to results beyond the expectation, if you want more quantitative result, this problem is going to reappear again. I just wanted to kill this because it's not so interesting. Uh, it's not as interesting as the other term. Okay? Also notice, if I'm not looking at ERM, you see where I use the fact that I'm doing ERM. Okay? Here. Okay? It's really here. Is the, the moment that I wanted to do this swapping on the minimum. If you're using, say, just say some optimization algorithm that is going to convert somewhere, and then it becomes trickier. Okay, so we're not going to go there yet for now. But you can imagine that this becomes a bit more complicated because I don't have a perfect minimum. I'm going to be far away that much, but you know, I'm going to have an epsilon. It is getting optimization error, and I have to work a bit more. Okay. So back to our question is okay. So but so I cannot. Just Blindly apply the law of large number. What can I do? Okay, and and here the theory can be made arbitrarily long. No, you can have a whole semester course on this question. Okay, and I'm just going to give you the 10 minutes version of this. The 10 minutes version of this is basically, I go from one function to a class of made of two functions and n functions, and then from there I have to be fancier than that. Okay, so the idea here is, we can if our you know, let's hallucinate a minute. If c was of size 1, if there was just one function, then I'm good to go. Because it's true that this is a random variable. So again, everything here is about the like fact that f at is a function of Sn, which itself means that it's a function of x1, y1, xn, yn. Okay. And, but there is there's just one function. There is just one function. So of course I can use this, right? I mean, I have a random variable that has one value. It's not a very interesting random variable, but I can do it. What if it has two values? Okay. What if I have two possible functions? Then it means that I have to control this quantity for both functions, and I can do it. Okay. And I can basically use the fact that. What we want to show is that we want to start to consider a quantity like this. So I'm going to write exactly the quantity I want to control, which I wrote a bunch of times. is just the empirical average minus the expectation. So let me put this out first. Okay. So if I have one function, hop, hop, all I have to do is to apply this machinery with this identification. If I have two functions, well, I, I, if I want to be sure that it holds for my f at, f at is going to be one of those two functions anyway, right? So if I know that it holds for each one of them, I'm good to go. So I'm going to check that it holds for the first. I'm going to check that it holds for the second one. Of course, now I have a stronger request because I'm using this law of large number not once, but twice. I have two events that have to be sure they hold at the same time. So now I'm going to pay a price. What is the price we pay? Is that basically we have to consider this probability and then a similar probability for other function. So again, let's make this <coughs> C equal 2. And then let's make what we said last time is let's call the two functions in the space H and G. It means that if I have to control the probability that is true simultaneously for both H and G, I have to I apply this rule on H. And then I get this thing that is smaller than minus n epsilon square. 
But then I have to apply the same thing on G, and I have to be sure that the pro you know, I have to sum up the two probabilities. Okay? So I have. Okay, so I, you have the same. Let me write it like this. Let me jump to the conclusion because we already said it last time. Let me see if this is good enough for everybody. So the idea is So if there is one function, I'm fine. Remember, I want to control this, OK? I want to control the deviation of empirical to expect it from the function I choose for. If there is one function, I'm fine. I just use the law of a large number. What if you have two functions? Well, if you have two, two functions, if you can assure that this is true, that the law of large number is true for any function, then this guy is going to be one of those. So it's fine. So this means that. One way to write this is to say, OK, I wanted this to be true for the supremum. So if I can prove that this is true for the worst possible function in the class, for the one for which this quantity is the biggest, then it's going to be also true for everybody else. Okay. So in particular, if you show that it's true for everybody, it's also going to be true for this. Long story short, this means that we have to, uh, if we are in the situation where C is made of just two functions, okay, we just have to consider this and then use it as many times as we have functions. So we're just going to get exactly the same result with the difference that, so these two here just come from the fact that I put a mod, OK? So you can forget it. These two here doesn't mean anything. It's just that it did what is called a two-sided inequality. But the important bit is that you get, an, um, well, you get another two. <laughs> that comes from the fact that I'm using now the law of large number twice, once on the function h, the other on the function g. Okay, and then I sum up the probabilities. If you now consider these to be a generic n, n functions, the same game applies. You just have to do, uh, this technique is called the union bound, and then you're just going to get here n. Okay? First so good? Okay, so let's stop. Uh, First of all, is there any question about this? It's, it's, a, it's a super standard technique, and all I'm using is basic. Uh, so the, the results, I'm, OK, this is just a background effect of how you go from expectation to probability. This is just a basic law of large numbers. And then I just use the fact that the, the probability of the union of events is bounded by the sum of the probabilities, OK, if the events are not independent. And that's what is called the union bound. And that's what I use here. Yes? Which from expectation of f1 of f hat minus f1 hat of f hat to probability over here? Because I wanted to use, you could, you could also try to go there directly, but I want to, to use the law of large number. And so this is the, I'm going to use these two lines. Okay. So uh, from the beginning, I told you I can look at probability and expectation. This doesn't matter a lot. Here, I, I, I use expectation to be able to kill quickly this. You can also quickly use using probability, it takes one more line. And now, to, to be fair and go back to expectation, you use this one line. OK? Does that make sense? OK, fair enough. Yes? So how do you eliminate, you eliminate the probability that, uh, uh, like, uh, when you compute ERM, you, you might find G this as guy? the minimizer? But, uh, but actually, F is the true minimizer of E. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Okay. Yeah, so when you compute ERM, um, yes. say you, you get the function G. No, I don't get a function G. I get a function we call F hat, so let's call it F hat. Or let's call it G hat. Yeah, this is not one function. Right? But, uh, this, there are many functions. Like yes. You call them all F hat, there are many, many, many. And so? So is it possible for, um, in this case, uh, uh, the minimizer of E is the function F, because you have two functions, right? Sorry, I still don't understand. So I have, uh, I have the space functions. Okay, then I have, a, I have, let's say, 
let's call F star the minimizer of the true risk, if it exists, okay? Let's call it F, F star C, because it depends on C, right? I'm not working anymore on the full space. And this is the F hat, which is the one I find on the data. They will be generally different, and I'm basically trying to find their distance, not really, because all I care about is how far are the two expected risks. And your question is? Yeah, because um, you, you, you have a size uh, requirement of C, right? There. Yeah. Yeah. But remember that all this theory is conditioned to the fact that I'm never looking at the best anymore. I'm always looking at the best in C, right? So. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I, 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 yeah. But um, and what, what what did I mean is basically that uh, you, you might you, you might I mean you, you might find different functions in the true best and the empirical best. Yes, and I'm just trying to evaluate how far they are. These two functions, you, um, you, you basically like uh, uh, using the su supreme, right? So um, you're bounding. So, but so let's look at the reasoning, okay? So I don't, I'm not quite sure I see the question. So, but the reasoning is, indeed, when I work on empirical data or with the full distribution, I might get different stuff. Even if I restrict myself to a small class, if there is only one function, it's trivial. But if there's function, of course, I had to understand what's going on. And I exactly want to quantify the distance of the error you obtain doing things in practice or when you have access to infinite data. And this is what we did here. We split the error in two parts. And at least we work an expectation of the two parts disappears. And all I have to do is this. So the question of how far are and the question of how far are these two quantities, the expected, the empirical to expected, are equivalent because it's an equality, at least in expectation. Okay? Then at this point, I'm actually shooting at this whole thing with the bazooka. Because what I'm doing is that rather than just focusing on this, that is the one generated by I say, I actually want this to be true for all the function in the class. And boom, this n appears, OK? In my bounds appears because I'm, I'm basically trying to, I get rid of the problem that I had, which is the fact that this one is not a fixed function, but it's a random variable, but requiring the law of large Uniform, to hold uniformly for all the function. This is what is called the uniform law of large numbers. Okay? And though I'm going to pay a price. Of course, this is an upper bound now. This is not an equality anymore. It's just an upper bound. Okay? An upper bound that depends on how big is the class. Okay? So I can take this offline if there's more. Okay, so there are at least a two, two line of, you know, we want to make a few comments, okay? One comment is that you remember that we defined the sample complexity, okay? This was the number of points that you achieved to achieve a certain accuracy. Well, here, we will basically have to solve this, we call this all quantity delta. And then you have to solve with respect to n. And this is going to be n0. So delta equal n to the e to the minus n epsilon square. What you get is that you get something that is like, uh, so let's see, epsilon square delta over n with the log, okay? Then we put the minus here. And this means that we get something like n, e, n zero, which is the, the quantity I cared about is going to be over epsilon square log, and then I have to swap the order of this, OK? So add a minus. And you basically see an equation that makes a lot of sense. It basically says, if I, the number of points is going to depend on the accuracy and the probability, OK, of the statement. Because we're working with probability, if you get rid of, if you get rid of the probability in working expectation, you're going to, you basically, this quantity is going to disappear. But at least in this case, it's going to depend on the accuracy. And the accuracy is higher. If you require higher accuracy, you need more points. That seems to make sense. If Similarly, if you want a very high confidence, which means that delta has to be small, you need more points. But then we have a crucial fact that is the one we're expecting all along, which is that, at least in this bound, if you're dealing with a small class, you need fewer points. But if you're dealing with a big class, you need more points. It doesn't enter too badly. It enters as the logarithm, but you still need a lot more points, OK? Which makes sense, because you're basically thinking, OK, if I minimize something on the data or on the true distribution, if I don't have a lot of stuff to look into, 
So if my bag is not so big, I can expect these two quantities not to be far away. But if my bag is very large, depending on the data set, these two quantities might be very different. Of course, everything is conditioned to the number of points, right? If you have enough points, it's going to be fine. Does it make sense? So this is the basic, uh, yes. Typically, you will want to be using a class C that will have an infinite number of functions in it, wouldn't Yes. In which case, the, the it's okay. So up to now, that's clear the next one. What he was saying, he was complaining about the fact that I just put a finitely many classes, OK? And we've been doing one month of reproducing kernel based space. This seems a bit at odds. And it's absolutely fine. But this phenomenon just shows you a qualitative effect that is that if you now study this and you wanted to understand what things are going on, at least I was showing that, that you know something like the size of the, of the of the class is going to matter, and then you can get bounds. And then one way to do it is to union bounds. Just uh, roughly speaking, just taking the union on the size of the law, deriving a uniform law of large numbers by taking a union of events over the size of your class. Okay, and qualitatively, this gives the first result. From a technical point of view, of course, the complaint is legitimate. It's like, OK, how do you go beyond, uh, beyond finitely many classes? And that's why you, you, know, you can spend a lot of time talking about this, because you basically have to be able to count how many things you have if you have infinitely many things. That's the idea. Okay? You have to take, a, a, say, even just linear functions are not finitely many. It's a finite dimensional space, but they're infinitely many. So you now have to be able to count how many finite functions you have. Right, sorry, linear functions you have. More generally, for any function, you have to be able to do, do something like this. And the rough idea is to use, uh, the, the, the idea common at most approaches is uh, to use covering numbers, okay? So covering numbers is uh, a bit complicated to uh, explain in details, but at least the rough intuition is clear. If I give you, you know, these functions, I can count them, right? So, but now instead of give you all these functions, all the functions inside of the circle, then good luck counting them, right? But what I can do is that I can actually consider smaller balls. So it is not completely clear from the picture. All these balls have the, exactly the same size. And I actually need a few more because I want you know to cover everything. Okay, so a covering. So basically, I'm going to take a bunch of balls. Oh, annoyed. It might not be the best. The idea is that what, what I'm going to do is then I'm going to try to take a set of anchor points, a net, as it is called, of uh, uh, functions, so that if I take balls around this point, I can get any function. Okay. So the idea is that if I take any point in here, then I have a center of a ball, which is not too far away from it. Okay, So we have to assume that the space of function we are considering can be infinite, but in some sense is like a ball. It's not arbitrarily complicated. And then we are going to cover it with smaller balls. And then the, the, the way you go to generalize this result is basically saying, A, I'm going to use exactly the same result on the center of the ball. So I'm going to replace this soup over C by the soup over the, you know, these points. And then I'm going to show that everybody else, all the points that I'm not taking, are not too far away anyway. OK? I'm not going to do this, OK? I, I, but, but this is how it goes. You can do it in 5 billion less fancy, but at least the proof in the, in the basic case is very easy. You can do it as an exercise. Maybe you're actually going to do it for an exercise. So you just, again, you replace C with this net, OK? And it's important that it's a covering. A covering means that the balls you're considering are going to, you know, there is, no, there is no point that doesn't have, uh, like, that doesn't have a center close to it, OK? The, the union of this ball is the whole function split class, OK? So you take ball ci, that, and their union is going to be the whole. And this has to be finitely many. So it's, it has to be a finite covering. So then this n is going to appear there. The proof on ci, so if I take the soup over c and replace it by the soup over, say, um, let me call fi. fi are these centers, OK? 
So if I replace this by f r f1 fn, it's the same as above. Okay, I replace the whole class with the centers. So in this case, I can just use this. I still have to see the price I pay by replacing the whole class with centers. But the intuition that I'm not going to develop is that it shouldn't be too hard because anyway, any other point in here, any other function is here, is close to one of these centers. So I do control. I can choose the rays of that ball. Of course, this n is going to depend on that. Okay. If I call, let me call del, no, delta no. If I call, uh, what shall we call it, eta, the radius of this ball, what I'm going to expect is that if I make the radius smaller, I'm going to get more balls, right? But that's fine. You know, you can just work this out and you get the result. Now the game start. Yes. We'll check it's the union of all the CIs is equal to it. It doesn't contain the C. Yes, yeah, it contains. Contains or equal. Okay. Covering contains C. It has to be smaller. Yeah, I have to be sure that everything is in there. Yes. How do we actually get this big N? Okay. How do you get it? Yeah. What do you mean? So let's take an example. A ball, so, take, uh, so the question is about, uh, the first question is about uh, the usual, fix uh, the mistake you made. Now the next question is, okay, can you give me an example, I guess, of this? What is what could be an epsilon, uh, an eta, okay? An exact example you can make because it's easy is the case of linear functions, okay? Because in linear functions, we're just dealing with this. So effectively, now we're just dealing with uh, Rd, with vectors in our, every function. It's easier, right? Every function is now a vector in Rd. So whenever you see Fix, uh, you can think of just a Wi. So now suppose that you take a ball, okay? So you say, okay, let me take now w smaller than 1, OK? So I just consider that ball. Now the question is now, OK, what is the volume of that is 1. So how many balls of radius eta I need to cover a ball of radius, of radius 1, OK? So how big is, how big is the, how big the ball of each of these guys? It's going to be something like eta to the d, roughly speaking, you know? And then you, you literally just have to do, you know, one over eta over d, okay? And this is going to be your n of eta. If I take this to be r, okay? So I just take this as a radius, and of course it's going to matter, right? If I take a much larger ball, I need more stuff. It's also fine because you're going to get something like r to the d there, right? You have the volume of the whole ball. And then you, you basically check how many balls you need in order to be sure that the volume is completely covered, and that's it. Okay. So that's the simplest example. But then you need to stop. On the, on the of course, of course, of course, of course. I mean, this is no, there is no free lunch here, okay? I'm not saying that you can just take any C you want crazy enough. No, in some sense, it has to be finite in a, in a reasonable way of measuring things. And again, the reason why this story is long is because then you can ask, you know, there are many different ways to build coverings, depending on different metric, depending on different assumption, depending on you know how you want to do it. There are empirical covering number, there are C infinity covering number, there are two covering number. I mean, it's really a long story. Okay, the way how you measure the size of an infinite set is long. And here I'm not trying to go too deep in that, but just tell you, okay, why do we care about the size? Because even in the finite set, set you see that it matters. Why the covering is a good idea? Because, for example, just in this simple example that was required, you see that it does, somewhat can measure, can count functions, even where there are infinitely many. So we already step in the direction you wanted. And now, of course, we can go nuts with this, right? Because you can say, okay, what if I put a feature map? Okay, what if I do this and that? And what if I know something about eigenvalues? And then is it related to information theory and entropy? Yes. It's all of this, okay? And, uh, and this is not what this course is about. This course is about just realizing that you can go in that direction. And of course, you can even ask the question, okay, what is the best measure? Can we show that this is an if and only if? Can we show, uh, there are very nice probabilistic results that just ask, okay, if I want to be controlled, 
can I show that you know, it's controlled if and only if a certain measure of size of the class is finite? Okay? Uh, there are many results in so-called, you know, characterizing the property of so-called uniform living who can tell the classes to uh, size of function classes. Okay? And uh, dimension <coughs> is just uh, specializing this result to the case where the function we're dealing with are Boolean. Okay? Fat shattering dimension is basically the same story as this. Okay, and pseudo dimension, and again, all that is basically just making whatever I said here for this simple case a bit fancier and a bit more precise. Because again, I do the obvious drawing, and the only example where the drawing is actually precise, right? Okay, so we're not going to go anywhere there. And maybe Sasha next week is going to say something about that. Again, things like Gaussian complexity, Gaussian width, Rademacher complexity are all in the direction of making this story precise. Okay. First, so good. So, what do we know? Aside from not knowing that there is a lot of knowing that there is a lot of literature, we know that we can uh, we have different measure of complexity, complexity or capacity, somewhat related to is the class that will allow us to actually derive the results we wanted to get result. For all of this story for us was just a way to go back to characterize this and show that it does go to zero. And more than that, showing that we can get a uniform result for any distribution, hence no complexity result. And basically, I, I, sh I proved it for the case of finitely many functions. I somewhat argued that the same story holds for linear functions. And I'm saying that you can actually generalize the whole story to much more complicated situation just by you know, banking on the notion of covering numbers. Okay. So there is a whole parallel story to this that is related to stability, but I'm not sure I have the time to do this. Uh, so let me let me just stick to this story instead. Okay. So uh, I just want to mention this as a remark, though. Rather than studying ERM directly, okay, and then using this union bound technique by counting the number of functions you have. And another thing you could do is to essentially show some stability property of ERM. What do we mean by stability? That if you run ERM for a training set or a slightly modified version of the training set, say one where I removed one point or changed one point, and I can prove that the result doesn't change much, for example, that the empirical error or the loss function doesn't change much, then I can also derive this kind of result. Okay? And the key point is, rather than having how big is the class, the key parameter is going to be how much it varies when you bother him by changing the test set, uh, sorry, the training set. Okay? That's what stability is about. It's kind of a nice point of view because it somewhat shows that you can think about things rather than things of like complexity of the class, just about in some sense continuity property of this map. I have a map that goes from the data to a function. If this map is not too crazy, it's continuous enough, it's actually smooth enough, then I'm able to say something about uh, about uh, its properties, okay? So it's a, I just, this is just a pointer to literature, but we're not gonna explore this. We want to move on and could essentially uh, go back to where we started, okay? So we have these parentheses about controlling, you know, uniform law of large numbers. <coughs> we can now go back to this question and we know that we can solve it. Uh, but we really want to go back to there, okay? And ask the questions that are still hanging up there, which are, can I, can I put back the right space? Can I put back my S, the right one, you know, the big one, okay? And can I derive some algorithm that is gonna be able to get there at least for any fixed distribution? This was a question we know the answer yet, right? And how would it look like? We know that ERM does the job here. I just do empirical risk minimization on the class, and it does a good job. But now I'm more ambitious, and I don't want to do just this class. I want to do more. I want to do the whole space. Of course, I will not be able to keep my soup, because I know that that's impossible. But I can still ask whether I'll be able to do something like this for any fixed distribution. So get universal consistency, correct? So before we get there, there is any question about this stuff? Yes. 
the beginning that we don't really care how close f hat actually is to the optimal f because we just care about how it does yes. there and such. But because you're doing everything and reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, is it actually the case that if you have low error in the sense that we've been considering so function f hat will actually be close to the function f? No, it's actually the, the other way around is true, but not this. So let me say the question for everybody. So I, I made the point that I made the point that I don't want f. So let me just rewrite this one second. I made the point that we don't want the function to be error to be closed. Okay, this can be rewritten just like this, right? Uh, we gave. So let me call. Uh, so this is f hat. I, I need a symbol for this. Let me call this f of f. This is the best. Or let's let's say f. Star of f is the best function in f. Let's assume that it exists and I can give it a name. Okay. So if I have a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and I also have to make the assumption that this function lives there, let's make it for a minute, then I can consider this. So hk here is the norm in the reproducing Hilbert space. Is it true that if you can control this, then you can control this? Hell no. But is it true that if you can control this, you can control that? Hell yes. Why? Because for many loss functions, I notice that for now loss functions are very general, but typically loss functions are considered to be convex and Lipschitz or square like stuff. And in both cases, you can basically show that the uh, sup norm is good, so that this is smaller than the infinity norm of that. Okay, and then because this one is even stronger than that, then you're good to go. Because so, <laughs> the other way around, it no, was it's, it's exact, so it's, exact, it's basically this. There is a constant for which this controls that. Because this, this is for, you remember, the continuity was that this norm controls function at every point, and here I'm just taking the worst possible point. So it's exactly this direction. The other direction is stronger. So this means that you can get result, but the bound which is worse, okay? You're asking for a stronger question. You want the function to be close rather than the error, and that's stronger. Okay, so it's fine, but it's uh, it's more than what you need. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, can we move on? Okay, so we are asking what we can achieve or not in our learning scenario. Oh, come on, that's. <laughs> Some people use a uh, error function because well, what does it mean to be close? People are trying to make the functions be close to one another. We yeah. have to make it uh, there, right? uh, Exactly. So do, do people use these type of functions because of their functions? Like this, guys. Oh, yeah, statistics is full of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, is that this an optimization? Absolutely. Okay. You know, in the linear case, remember in the linear case, this just become W. At uh, minus w star period, okay? And, you know, in, in RD. So whenever you see in statistics parameter estimation as opposed to prediction, that's because you're using this. Suppose that you do regression and you say, oh, I want to do parameter estimation. I don't care about prediction. Oh, that's you're using because you're using stronger norm, okay? And uh, if you do optimization, you know, typically you care about the minimizers rather than the minima. And again, you look at stuff like this all the time. Okay. Uh, in machine learning, there is a tendency to look at the weakest possible thing you do. So again, instead of an expectation, you work in probability. Instead of in this sense, you work in that. Maybe along the way, then you use sometimes to get some results of this. But ultimately, we're shooting for that because that's kind of the minimal requirement. But yes, pointwise estimation, you know, parameter estimation. There's plenty of question where this makes sense, either because it's a step in the proof or because it just makes sense. In learning, this, this is a nice interpretation. It's the error you make. Okay. I'm gonna move on quickly before you. Okay, so, uh, okay, fair. We, we know that we can do this whole thing replacing uh, the true target class with the smaller one. Can we use this somehow to actually achieve our original goal? And the idea is to essentially do the following. We basically want to consider not one class, but a sequence of class. And we are hoping that this sequence 
and so classes. Each one is nice, and they eventually go in the right place. So what I mean is, so I have f, okay, and right now we considered, say, c contained in f. Now what I want to do is that I actually consider a sequence of ci. All of them is contained in F. I can have infinitely many. Each one of them has that property, okay? And the property, what it means is that is the property is, is a finite size in some suitable sense, okay? In some covering or some complexity measure. So I can get the, the result I want, the result on the excess risk for any of these CIs, okay? We're making this assumption. And we further make the assumption that, um, so let me call, uh, so let me say like this, lim of sup rho delta n rho <coughs> ci is equal to zero when n goes to infinity. And uh, I need a symbol to denote the size of this stuff, okay? Because we know that this is true only if they have finite size. So I actually made the assumption that the size of say C1 is more or equal than the sign of C2 and so on. Okay. So the index here doesn't just stand for a sequence. It stands for a sequence of classes that get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. The simplest case could be uh, I take one function, two function, three function, and then I take all of them. Okay. Or uh, it could be because you know, in this thing here, I take, uh, uh, I fix this eta, and then I take different radius of the ball, okay? I take a ball of a certain radius, then I get a certain complexity. I take another ball, I take another complexity, correct? So in, bo in both the example we made, we can imagine a situation where rather than one example, we can consider one class, we consider a sequence of classes that have bigger complexity. Again, here you're just increasing the cardinality of the set. Here you're just increasing the radius of the ball. And you already see that this is going to, just a spoiler, this is going to smell reg like regularization. Because you see, we just put a budget on our Ws, okay? And this is going to become regularization in a second. Okay, so we make the assumption that we key, we choose this structure and we chose it, okay? We're not learning it, we're not, it, we chose it, it's given, okay? And then we can try to deploy some idea to actually be able to get that result. So again, our final goal is to show that there exists for all rho, an algorithm for which I can prove this result. Okay, which means that the excess risk goes to zero. I need one further result, uh, which is that I have to some sense say that this, each, when I take all of this, okay, this become a large class, okay? It covers everything. So what I need to know is that if you take now the union of all the CI, okay, so CI here is not a covering or anything, okay? It's just different classes. I'm just, you see the same symbol here, don't get confused. You have to be sure that when you consider not one, but all of them, okay, or if you want the largest of them, you don't lose anything, okay? That this is actually equal to doing the thing on the whole space. So these are our requirements, okay? We want each of the class to be simple enough to be able to be learned in the sense that the excess risk on that class goes to zero. We want to somewhat foliate this class in an ordering for which you know, the simplest class happens are the one corresponding to a certain index and then have the others. And I also want to know that if I take them all, I have to be able to consider the whole space, okay? We see what happens if we drop this last assumption, it's gonna be pretty clear. Now let's introduce the algorithm we want. It's just empirical risk minimization on one of these classes, okay? So it's gonna be minimum of E hat over C. Okay, and this gives me my f hat i. i here, again, is the index of the class I'm considering, which corresponds to a certain size. For example, you know, it could be, I consider empirical risk over five functions and then over 10 functions. 
11 functions. Or I consider empirical risk over linear functions when I pick the radius to be 1, then 2, then 3, then 10, and so on. Okay? This i, for example, think of it as the, the size of the radius. Okay? Get it bigger and bigger and bigger. Make sense? So now the story is pretty. So now we want to control this, right? And the idea is that here, in some sense, we are doing regularization. And regularization, we think about as a, as a trade off between fitting the data and uh, uh, we introduce the bias, but we want the bias not to be too big. We try like to fit the data, but we also would like to have some kind of stability, and so on and so forth. This is what I'm going to show up now. We need the further notation. We need to introduce fi, which is the algorithm with infinite data. So you allow yourself to use infinite data, but you still restrict yourself to this class. Again, what does it mean in that case? You, can, you have access to infinite data. You can minimize the expected risk, but you're still doing it, for example, over a ball of a certain radius or over five functions. So, of course, you're not going to get everything, right? So now we want to study this by adding and subtracting this. So you have E of F hat i minus E of F hat i. So here I have a hat, and here I don't have a hat. Okay. So in words, what did I do? Well, first of all, I introduced a, a notion of algorithm, which is slightly different from empirical risk, because it's not just one empirical risk, but it's a sequence of empirical risk. It's one over a space, which it, it itself is simple, but it gets more and more complicated. So for each one of them, I can get my sample complexity, but the sample complexity is gonna increase because you're losing larger and larger space, okay? You wanna think about this as a regularization parameter now. And this is like a, as a meta procedure that should be able to somewhat describe generally what we do and how we think about and why, in some sense, the regularization naturally arises from first principles. Okay. So once we have this, and this class has to satisfy this property, we take the error we care about and we split it in two parts. And now we, look, we can look at what are these two parts. The first one is my algorithm with finite data and infinite data. Compare how well they perform. Okay. It's clearly a stochastic quantity. Clearly depends on the size of the class. And it's what is typically called the sample or estimation error. So this guy is called the sample or sometimes the estimation error. It's clearly a stochastic quantity because it depends on the data. So we will need to use a stochastic uh, quantity. But notice that this is exactly the quantity we already studied, right? Is the empirical risk on one class versus the, the expected risk on that class. So at least in this simple case of empirical risk, you can tell me how much this is. It's written over there. It's going to be uh, smaller than epsilon. If I take a number of points, bigger than something that depends on the size of this one class we are considering. Correct? So this error goes down when the class become bigger or when the number of points gets larger. Correct? What about this? Does it depend on the data? No. If you look at the definition, which is uh, carefully hidden to your eyes, it's just expected risk on the class. So it, doesn't dep it depends on the distribution, but it doesn't depend on the data. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's not a statistical quantity, it's a geometric quantity. And what do you think is going to be the behavior of this quantity with respect to i? Remember that i gets, uh, gets more complicated classes, bigger classes, as i goes larger. So probably this stuff is going to go down, right? How fast? So here, we can basically say that this, uh, you know, this term is going to be roughly, this whole term is going to be roughly 
you can check this is going to be roughly log i, because i is the set of my class, square root of n. Okay? It's the same bound that we have here. Instead of solving for, del for n, I solve it for epsilon. Okay, so if I solve it here for epsilon, I that with probability delta, or 1 minus delta, I know that this quantity is then something that is going to depend on n and epsilon. Okay, so that's what I did here. So this first term is going to be smaller than something that is proportional to the size of the class divided by square root of n. Yep. So we're assuming that each of the CIs that you find contain all previous. Yes, for now, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sorry, let's do this too. So C1 is containing C2 and so on. Yeah, let's do that too. Okay, so I can tell you roughly what is the behavior of this. I, we can kind of guess that the behavior of this is going to be decreasing in the goes uh, larger. How fast? It's not clear. It, you have too many, too few details. You know, it's not so clear. But uh, actually, what I want to, to convince yourself is that even just a simple example, you can. The answer is going to be arbitrarily slow unless I make some assumption about the row. Okay. First of all, notice that to answer the question that we gave ourselves, we're good to go. Okay, because we didn't care about how fast. We just wanted something that went to zero. So now this goes to zero and controls the probability. This zero because I set up everything in such a way that it does go to zero and that's all I care about in this uniform consistency okay of course if you consider just linear models like the one I wrote here the assumption that taking so suppose that I'll make that you can check that this is not going to be enough to achieve universal consistency you need larger function spaces okay why well because you see in that example, each of these CI is a ball in the linear class. And when I take the union of all the balls, so each ball is containing to the other, but when I take the union of all the balls, what do I get? All possible linear function with any slope. And clearly, <laughs> this is no way true, right? It's not true that linear function is going to be big enough. And that's, in some sense, the nice property of, say, something like the Gaussian kernel. Clearly, you can do exactly the same gate replacement with, with feature maps, but you will be taking norm in the RKHS. And if you take balls in a Gaussian kernel space, okay, in, a, in the reproducing kernel space, you put into a Gaussian kernel, instead it does have exactly this property. That if you let the number of the size of the balls in the reproducing kernel space norm become larger and larger and larger, eventually you get the whole universe, you know, you, an all reproducing kernel space, and that is universal which means just this. So we say that an hypothesis space is universal if it's true that basically we don't pay a price by replacing the space we like, which is the whole space, with this, in principle, smaller space. So in some sense, from a point of view of exact minimization, considering a uh, Gaussian kernel is as good as not making any assumption. This is weird, right? Because it does feel we are making an assumption. Well, in fact, the assumption is going to bite us back is this idea that we are using balls. Okay, so the moment we use balls in there, we are basically deciding we are breaking the symmetry of this big space F. Okay, we have this space, we have this big space F, and I know that if I have to, if I have to draw the space H that corresponds to, you know, if I if I let this be my H. And you assume, for example, that this is a reproducing kernel space which is large enough, for example, the Gaussian kernel, is going to be as big as this, OK? It's basically, uh, for the purpose of minimization of the expected risk, going to be the same. When I consider a ball, I'm considering a smaller space. And I consider another ball, another space, and so on and so forth. They will have the same center, actually, but OK? The moment I choose this, I'm basically choosing where to put the center and what does it mean to grow complexity in the space. Okay, And I choose, for example, del2 norm. But then you can say, what about del1 norm? And what about something else? Okay, And the moment you made this assumption that we made by choosing the classes, okay, we said, OK, you have this big space, but I decompose it in these parts. And these parts have to be somewhat related to each other somehow, because I want to talk about increasing complexity. Well, the moment you do that, you're breaking the symmetry of that big space, and you're choosing somewhat favorite directions in which you are going to explore. And so clearly, they, I'm not sure if it's clearly, but I hope to give at least an intuition. 
I can make this arbitrarily small, uh, so arbitrarily bad. How? Well, tell me your scheme. I'm going to choose the function that violates your symmetry breaking here. You want to go from small ball to large balls? I'm going to start with a function with a huge, in some sense. Okay? Or, look, I just take a function which has just one component. So it's super sparse, but it, that's, that component is very high norm. So it's a super simple function, but it's a very bad L2 norm. Okay? So this is what is called the approximation error. And this story basically tells you where the no free lunch theorem is coming from. It's not really a, a probabilistic problem. It's really a geometric problem. It's the problem that we chose to, whenever you chose to, you know, whenever you, in some sense, abstracting this, and whenever you choose an algorithm, you're choosing how to explore a space. And whenever you tell me how you explore the space, I can trick you by choosing a problem for which that's a bad idea. And it's a pure geometric fact. This, of course, is not unrelated to classical statistics, right? This is not a variance, but it roughly has the same role. It tells you how much things vary when you change the data. This is not a bias, but also this kind of tells you the same thing. You introduce somewhat an offset for which even if you have perfect information, you don't get to the right place. Okay? So if you're familiar with the bias variance trade-off, this is the learning theory version of that, which is a simple approximation trade-off. And if you want, this is a meta description of what regularization is about. Okay? Basically, it's the idea of uh, deciding one way to explore your space and do it in such a way that the, 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 it's parameterized by some complexity parameter, some regularization parameter. You explore simpler stuff first and then more complicated stuff later on, and then you have to strike a balance between these quantities. Okay? This doesn't immediately give you one algorithm, okay? Or if you want, it gives you a algorithm, this. You can now show that, you know, it just gives you a way to think about what you're doing, okay? Whenever you do regularization, you can think that implicitly you're doing something like this. If we went the way of stability, which I skipped, you know, in the, how to control generalization through stability, you would have yes another point of view. If you say, I take algorithms that are stable and become less stable when I have more data, which is fine because I'm getting more, more data, less data, okay, so more data. And then I could build the whole theory on that, but that's more or less never done, okay? That's something somebody should write down. But this is the basic story, okay? So here you basically have the, you can go back to your favorite plot. And notice that this theory is very pessimistic, okay? I mean, this is the worst case scenario. I'm not making any benign assumptions. I'm assuming that the worst possible thing can happen. And I'm just discovering a fundamental fact in the worst case. This by no means says that you don't have a situation where the situation is nicer than that. You consider a situation where you have enough data that the empirical risk is of the right size, okay? So for example, if you have more points than the sparsity of, you know, if you have some structural assumption like sparsity or something like that, if the number of points is bigger than the number of uh, uh, sparse element in your vector, probably the variance, you can essentially control it and just make it of the order of the noise, okay? You don't need to do, it's not bad, okay? If your model is too simple, okay, uh, probably you don't gonna see this uh, big problem with the bias, in the sense that the bias is gonna flatten out. I take a polynomial function and I try to approximate it with a linear function. <laughs> you know, it doesn't go to zero or nothing, it just goes to something which is gonna be. So this picture is, is not, in practice, you, you can, you know, with specific data set, you might see different pictures, okay? And typically, you, the typical picture you see is that the, the crazy overfitting, you know, the crazy fact that augmented the complexity is not as dramatic because the problem might be nicer, the data can be enough, or your, or your model can be stupid, okay? These are these two opposite regimes. Or the problem, either the problem is easy or the, the algorithm I choose is easy. You don't have to rethink anything. Now, um, just, yeah, I have. Just a couple of comments, okay? So let's stop one second, where are we? We asked our big fundamental question of how to do, you know, measure the quality of an estimator. Then we try to understand a bit what's possible and what's not. 
we discover, we, we give our list a list of potential things that we can do and cannot do. So one thing we cannot do is to find finite sample bounds for any problem in the world. We can do it for any problem in the world if we change the problem. That's the first thing we did. We can find no sample bounds, but at least this universal consistency for any fixed distribution. Okay, and that's what we just discussed. And in some sense, you see that that's how regularization arises. Because in some sense, the first one was regularization with no regularization parameter, right? Because it's like thinking, I'm going to take Tikhonov with lambda equal to 55. And I'm going to study this algorithm. And this is my whole theory. And I can say, why 55? 55. <laughs> and you say, but how about, no, 55. Then you move it, and then you understand that you have to keep into account what's happening when you move it. And then you need to talk about the larger space you move in, and blah, 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 blah. And then you basically end up in this story. Okay? And you also discover that the moment you chose that ball you chose, you're basically foliating the space in such a way that there is some good direction, some bad direction. And the no free lunch is just hiding around the corner. Okay? It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to get back at you. Of course, at this point, perhaps you can also tell me the last question we want to, you know, something in the direction of the last question we wanted to ask, which is what about rates of this whole thing? Okay? Could I actually get not only a bound that says that this stuff goes to zero, where the number of points goes to infinity, but also something about how fast it goes to zero? Well, the problem clearly is not here. The problem is here. This quantity, this A of i, is decreasing, but not for, I don't know how fast it can be decreased for any problem, right? But still, consider, for example, this example, you know, the example where you have balls. Could we hope to get some rate of how fast that goes to zero? Well, we, we know already that, for example, if you take a Gaussian kernel, it's too big, right? So we need to make some restriction on the class of probability distribution. So we cannot take any probability distribution. We have only take some nice probability distribution. But basically then if my, if, for example, suppose that I tell you that my function actually, the, the true function, lies in a ball in a Gaussian kernel. Okay, it does. It's an assumption I'm making. I take distribution for which the exact function, the correct one, the best one that I cannot see, lies in a ball. I don't know the ball radius, okay? I cannot use it right away, but I know that it will lie there. And then I'm gonna use an algorithm that somewhat change the radius of the ball. Well, how much is the rate of this? Well, if it's big enough, it becomes because at some point I hit the right radius of the ball and this whole quantity becomes zero. If you do the Tikhonov version, okay, this is the, even you put a constraint on the radius. We, we mostly work in the case where you penalize and you have lambda and you assume that you have the eigenvalue decay. And remember that I discussed a lot about principal components, non-principal components, so on and so forth. You can review this whole story in that sense, okay? If, you, if I tell you something like my, the function I'm looking at does have energy information in the first few principal components, then I'll be able to get rates here, okay? If you tell me something about not only the fact that I have a ball, but something more than then the ball, there is a, a somewhat a set with some, uh, because all you care, well, no, that's too complicated, forget about that. There are further assumptions, okay? If you tell me something about uh, um, the problem, okay? So if you have to tell me something about rho, then I'll be able to control this and give you a rate, okay? Not for any row, but as for any row in there, okay? Now, the story is almost finished here. There are still questions about, okay, how do you choose the best possible complexity? Okay, and we're gonna, I think we're gonna try to design a sanctioning exercise for you to discover this. The story basically goes that this story is fine, but typically requires knowledge of things that you don't have. But if you do cross validation, you can do as well as if you could do this right away. Okay, so basically, cross validation, what you've always been doing is gonna be an easy answer. Actually, do something really nice, at least in some simple cases and provably. But this is basically the whole story. Okay, uh, we wanted to achieve some. Goals, and this was the last, try to get rates, and this is one way to get it. Uh, again, if you now take any algorithm that you know, typically end up analyzing this kind of stuff, and basically you have to make some, if you want to get rates, you choose an algorithm, then you have to try to understand what is the class of functions for which it works or not. Then you're gonna do some sample analysis, an approximation bound, some 
combination of the two, and so on and so forth. Okay? And depending on how nice you make the assumption about the problem, you can get a bound like that or something much simpler. Than that. What we're going, to dis we're going to discuss in the next three classes, for example, we know pretty much the answer. There, there are still open problems for classical algorithms like logistic regression and, and uh, least squares, for example, but we know uh, really a lot about those. For neural networks like architecture, the question of what is the function class they're really trying to learn, it's not completely clear. Uh, and it's kind of a chicken and egg problem to some extent, so it's not an easy question, okay? And also, what is the best way to understand how things are uh, constrained is also not completely clear. I, I'll say just one, two more things. One is, uh, um, one thing I didn't discuss, which is actually my favorite topic in this whole story, is that this is ignoring optimization completely. I only mentioned this very quickly at some point, but there is no optimization in this picture, and that's totally crazy. Okay? The only thing that comes out of your computer is what comes out of optimization. So what you should really put in this story, what you should really put here, is not just some ideal thing that you can compute. You should put whatever comes out of the computer, and then you would have to include some auto optimization into this picture. Okay? That's what people have been doing last year, try to avoid this dichotomy between optimization and statistics. And I didn't mention this at all, and this, I think, is actually one of the exciting direction of work because it combines numerical aspects and statistical aspects at once. And the last thing I want to say is bye-bye because this is my last class. So you're going to be left in the end of George. I hope you enjoyed this.